Hello, everyone. My name is Naya Blair Hackworth. My pronouns are she and her, and I serve as the Director of Inclusion in the NCAA Office of Inclusion. Thank you for joining us today for the How to Serve Your, Your Campus Community webinar. Today's event is sponsored by the NCAA Office of Inclusion and the Minority Opportunities Athletic Association. Last week, we partnered with DICE to host the webinar on Building and Sustaining Your Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Council. And today, we're looking forward to discussing and focusing on campus collaboration and alignment and navigating shared resources and competing priorities. Before the start of today's program, the NCAA Office of Inclusion invites you to acknowledge and honor, and, and honor Indigenous communities natives for our region. We recognize that the NCAA National Office sits upon the land of the Miami and Lunapi peoples in the wider Indiana region, encompasses the homelands of the Kickapoo, Shawnee, Peoria, and Potawatomi peoples. We acknowledge the genocide and systems of oppression that have deprived indigenous people of their lands, and we, were, and we pay respect to elders, both past and present. We recognize that we are caretakers of the land and not its sole owners. We also want to acknowledge that November is National Native American Heritage Month. While we highlight, educate, and celebrate the contributions of indigenous peoples, let us be reminded that our acknowledgement should go beyond November. Today's program is an example of our office's commitment to provide support and resources for the athletics diversity and inclusion designee community. We are grateful to continue our longstanding partnership with MOA in the form of providing an educational program based on your needs that were shared in the ADID survey conducted earlier this year. I would now like to introduce Stan Johnson, Executive Director of MOA and President of Stan Johnson and Associates, who will provide information about MOA and what today's program entails. Stan? Thank you, Nye. I appreciate the opportunity to be here. And on behalf of the members of MOA and the Board of Directors, I want to welcome you to this fall webinar. Uh, the MOAA, in, in collaboration with the NCAA, is, is providing this education to support individuals who serve as the ADI and, and those of you who are with us today who are have an interest in DEI. We appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to participate. As Naya said, campus DEI professionals and others who support uh, and look at enhancing uh, DEI on their campuses are vital to the success of uh, working in this area. This session will focus on campus collaborations and alignment, navigate shared resources. Our goal is to assist you in developing resources that best serve your campus needs. Uh, I wanna thank the NCA Office of Inclusion for their partnership. Uh, and and in, in, in particular, uh, Naya Blair Hackwork and Abigail and Marquetta Dixon, for, uh, Marquetta Dickens from the MOIC for joining us and being a part of this. Uh, uh, MOA is always interested in how do we enhance opportunities for individuals, no matter at what level they are. And so we ask you to, to look for this and other uh, opportunities that we'll have in the coming years. Uh, and we look forward to sharing. And I'm going to leave this to the professionals at this and let uh, them handle it. And I want to turn it over now to Angel Mason, Dr. Angel Mason. I have to say that, Dr. Angel Mason. Uh, Director of Athletics at Barry College, and she will introduce the panel and get us started. Thank you, Stan. Welcome, everybody. We have a very strong panel for you all today, um, all from the University of Miami. A big part of today is being able to provide you guys examples and ways in which you can work within the field of DE&I, as well as live up to whatever expectations have been created for you on your campus with the ADID designation. So without further ado, I would like to introduce our panelists today. First, we have Dr. Don Spivey, who is a distinguished professor of history at the University of Miami. He has been a member of the University of Miami faculty since 1993. He specializes in US history since 1865, African-American history, sport, 
Labor, Music and Education. He recently published the book, Racism, Activism and Integrity in College Football, The Bates Must Pay Movement, and his book, If Only You Were White, The Life of Leroy Satchel Page, will become a television series produced by Magic Johnson on Apple TV. In July of 2020, the president of University of Miami appointed him to serve as special advisor to the president on racial justice. So thank you, Dr. Spivey, for being with us. I also have Dr. Renee Miles Payne, who has been at the University of Miami since October of 2019. She was hired as the Senior Associate Director for Administration and designated the Chief Diversity Officer on June 19, 2020. Her administrative career spans 24 years. She is the Vice President of MOA and has served on several university conference and NCAA committees. And last but definitely not least, Dr. Marvin Dawkins began his tenure with the University of Miami in 1988 as the Director of Africana Studies. He is also the Director of Graduate Studies in the Sociology Department and became a full professor of sociology in 2000. In 2012, he was selected to be the faculty athletic rep for the Hurricanes and served as president for the ACC's FARS in 2017 to 18. His publications on sports and society are frequently used in articles and dissertations. One of his most cited articles is African-American golfers during the Jim Crow era. In May of 2020, he was instrumental in revitalizing the university's standing committee on diversity, equity, and inclusion, and was appointed co-chair of the committee by the University of Miami president. Thank you all for being with us today. We have really a condensed amount of time for this heavy topic. And so we're gonna jump right in. And I think everyone would like to know what has influenced your thinking around DE and I and motivated you to get involved in this work? And we'll, well start. I'll start. Yeah, I'll, I'll start as um, the athletic, um, the, um, professionally here and a DID designated person in the athletic department. So I've been in this work since 2008, nine. So this is definitely not new for me. And the work has specifically been in athletics. I recall when the legislation was passed last year, um, I consulted with about 30 schools. Um, people who had been you know, named the ADID and had no clue what step to take, what was the first thing to do. And so I actually walked through with people exactly, here's, here's step one. You know, um, I you know, encouraged them to not do a, a, a diversity plan. You just need an instruction manual. I actually like a recipe right now because of everything that was happening. So don't try to you know, overwhelm yourself with putting together a plan. Um, just just kind of do step by step and listen to, to your student athletes and listen to the people. So I've been encouraged in this work since, since that time. Um, and I'm from Mississippi, the, the most racist state in the country. And so I have lived some of this as well. And so um, it is a part of who I am and, and how I was brought up. So that's what encouraged me to get into the work. Uh, thank you. Thank, thank you so much, Dr. Miles. Should I go second, I, I guess? Yes, uh, go second, yeah. Doug. We can, we can, be, we can be informal and... here too, uh, <laughs> right. gentlemen, because we always are with each other. <laughs> well, it's always a danger whenever you let a historian speak, we could be here all night, but I'm, I'm gonna stay with my, my four points that I just wanna, wanna make. At the University of Miami, I think it all began really with, with the push by President Frank when he issued his 15 point plan uh, in, in July 1st, uh, 2020. Uh, I've been here 28 years. Marvin Dawkins has been here even longer, but I've, I've been here 28 years and the change it made has been nothing short of just extraordinary. I'll give you one example. Uh, Professor Dawkins can confirm this, that there was a group of us for more than 20 years, we used to, a group of four, we used to go over and complain 
<laughs> every year uh, to the president uh, and the provost. And this dates back to when Tad Foote was president and Louis Glazer was provost. So this is, you know, like early 90s. Uh, and we talk about the number of Black faculty members that were brought in. It was never more than two, <laughs> never more than two. This year alone, the University of Miami brought in 14. Does, does that give you a sense right there? Now to keep them is something else, right? Okay. I just wanted to mention that the, the 15 point plan uh, is making a, a difference. Uh, one of the key elements of that 15 point plan is the creation of the reinvigorated standing committee, which Dr. Renee Callen and Dr. Marvin Dawkins are the co-chairs. And this is 41 members of, of the university of every unit of this university, right? So not just the Coral Gables campus, there are three campuses at the University of Miami, the Coral Gables campus, the medical campus, and the Rasmus campus, where the, the Rosenstiel of Marine Sciences and Atmospheric School is, is located, uh, et cetera. So we have these three campuses. Uh, and diversity officers on all three campuses have, have been there before. <laughs> As one diversity officer told me in the past, being a diversity officer at the University of Miami was like being on a circular firing squad because we didn't know what the other groups were doing we now know what they're doing. We're on, we have this standing committee and we meet as a group to coordinate our efforts. Crucial to the 15 point plan was the uh, uh, appointment of, of Dr. Uh, uh, Renee Miles Payne uh, as athletic uh, director of athletic diversity, uh, uh, the key officer there uh, in that component. Uh, and so, Everything is fully uh, integrated as we move forward uh, on, on these, is, these issues to make this a better place, not only for diversity in terms of on the campus, but in the larger community uh, as well. I'll stop at that point because if I keep going, we'll be here all night. Thank you. So I guess I'll turn okay, it over. Okay, this is Marvin. Marvin. Yes, this is Marvin Dawkins. So I'm a professor of sociology and um, I have um, been here at the University of Miami for almost 33 years, but uh, I've been in the field for over 40. Um, and issues of race, equity have been a part of my research program for um, for many years, you know, for, for, for over 30. Um, and so as a scholar who studies, um, studies um, uh, uh, issues of access in different institutional settings, I've been involved in research on um, the long-term effects of school desegregation um, issues of access um, in, in, in various other areas, access to uh, mental health um, treatment and uh, substance abuse programs um, on the part of people of color and margin, other marginalized groups. So my um, interest in, in, in issues, especially race and, and, and equity have been longstanding. Um, my work in race and racism in sports has also been long-term. So it sort of became uh, natural um, for me to um, be called upon to uh, become involved in uh, athletics here at the University of, of Miami and extending my um, role um, as a scholar to that of an advisor to the president of the university and the athletics director has been the, um, the role as some of you, most of you uh, know uh, of, the, uh, of the FAR, um, particularly advising on um, areas of institutional control, academic and Integrity and student welfare and well-being, student athlete 
welfare and well-being. Um, what is um, very challenging uh, for uh, designees, uh, DEI designees in um, athletics is that um, athletics has been um, not formally, but in some areas treated as being exempt from those challenges that, I mean, those um, goals, setting goals for diversity and inclusion, especially when it comes to bringing in your team, uh, whether you're at the coaching level, the staff level, what I have found that that is a problem in athletics is, hey, you bring in your people, and that is um, kind of what the sport is about, what athletics is about, whether it's at the professional level, whether it's at the college level, uh, and that's not a question. Your team is whoever it is. So, what does equity mean? Equity means fairness. You know, and uh, is it fair or is it not fair to give uh, um, from coaches to administrators the latitude to bring in whom they feel most comfortable with? So that's a very, very important challenge. Very, very important challenge. So I think that you guys who are in athletics and in diversity, equity, and inclusion, uh, I think that you have to blaze some paths. You've got to work with H&R um, &R offices. You've got to work with coaches. You've got to work to, with ADs on how to achieve diversity, equity, and inclusion goals uh, within athletics. Uh, I'm the, uh, one of the co-chairs of the Standing Committee on Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion for the entire university. But I think the area that's going to be most challenging and continue to be challenging is in athletics because the norms in athletics have more to do with giving people the latitude to bring in whomever they want. And um, certainly there are people who are at the leadership level who uh, understand the importance. Hopefully there are um, ADs like um, Kevin White at Duke University, who's like the Bill Walsh, if you know who Bill Walsh and his uh, people were in Tony Dungy, uh, who have uh, who have been uh, really champions of diversity. Uh, and I want to say one other thing um, by introduction in terms of the challenges of this role, and it has to do with what do we mean by diversity and inclusion? You can't say diversity without inclusion. If you say diversity and what that means to you is composition, uh, having uh, a diverse looking, having a, a, an organization that looks diverse, if there is no um, inclusion, that is if you don't draw from the perspectives of your diverse organization, then diversity is just wind addressing. So it's more than just counting how diverse your uh, organization is, is also making sure that those individuals are at the table and at least sharing perspectives that make the organization reflective of that diversity, not just diverse in opinion, but diverse in inclusion. I'm gonna stop too, I'm not a historian, but um, I have to stop. <laughs> Um, so that we can get to other questions. Thank you. Um, so for everybody that's in the room, a lot of our, our guests here today have been either given or are working with individuals ha who have been given the designation of athletics, diversity, and inclusion designee. And so can <laughs> one or two of you speak to the group about how you believe the ADID designation has changed or will change the work around DE and I and athletics departments. Look, does anybody have tenure? Not in, not in athletics normally. So, so no, I'm just raising that really rhetorically. 
because um, sometimes faculty uh, will say, you know what, I can say anything I want to say because I have tenure and nobody can really fire me unless I do something that is um, really out of line. I think the office that the desert need, it's a good thing, but it has its challenges. It's like putting people who are part of the aggrieved population in positions to lead the goal, achieving goals for which the organization should, should be achieving. So when you put people of color, when you put women, when you put minorities in positions, then uh, it looks like oftentimes they are held responsible if there's no progress. When the progress should be made because there's a commitment at the top. So as a desert knee, I think it's very important before you become the desert knee that you have that conversation that I'm sure Renee Miles Payne has had and others of you, I'm sure, will want to know what that conversation is. And that conversation is with the person who you're reporting to to make sure that the leadership has the commitment. So achieving the goals with, um, of diversity, equity, and inclusion, being that desert need is going to put you sometimes in a position of challenging the norm. And I think the norms that have existed in athletics are such that, as I said, it's an uphill climb, changing the culture to so that throughout athletics, there's a consciousness of the need for uh, achieving diversity, equity, and inclusion, and making sure that you are not put in position of being uh, viewed as someone who's ruffling feathers. That commitment has to be from the top. Could I add to that? Let me just add one thing to that, but which Marvin didn't say, and which of course we, we won't mention but since we're, but I guess we're among friends so we can go ahead and share this information. Uh, as Renee knows, uh, quite quite frankly, and Marvin has made this, this point, that those of us for, with, with tenures are now on this standing committee. So yes. individuals who don't have tenure can go to us, can tell us what the problems are, and we can tell it to right. the president right. and the provost uh, and, 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 and so forth, because we can't be fired. So we are the, the bearers of bad news or what you should yes. do, uh, et cetera. But, but it, it starts again with that standing committee, the fact that we, we are in the same room, we do share these ideas, uh, et cetera. But Marvin is quite right. So let the the tenured faculty members, when you form these kinds of organizations, the heat. Let, them, right, let them lead, let them take the bad news to the higher administration. Right. I, and I, I wholeheartedly, as a person that sits in that role, like many of you on this call, that is what I do. When I run into certain walls, right here in my own athletic department, understand, I'm, I can be fired easily, quickly. But if I give the argument in a fair way to Marvin and Don and say, hey, this is an issue and we really need to address it. Well, guess who they are addressing that to? The university president. It's no longer just sitting on me and what I have to do in communication with my athletic director. It is now sitting with two people who have who've been here over 30 years, who are real, well respected on this campus and who, who sit and advise the university president. So you must, you must make those connections on your campus with those people. You must find who those people are to be allies for you and to collaborate with you in this work because you can't do it alone because you are not tenured. <laughs> you, you can be fired. So you will ruffle feathers, but before you get fired and ruffling those feathers, have some, have some people that can go, go on your behalf for you and, and be like a human shield for you. Can I add something to this? We've got to give credit 
to presidents, at least in the case of FARS, the Faculty Athletics Representative. The Faculty Athletics Representative is one person, one person per institution. The NCAA mandates that all member institutions has one. That one person is appointed by the president. So the president knows of, of an institution, knows whom he or she is appointing. When they appoint and they have to appoint people who are tenured and associate a full professor, uh, in my case, I'm a full professor, the president knows and invites um, openness, frankness, and expects that from us. People ask me about my job. I don't have a job as a father. That's a role. That's service. I don't get extra money. So that when the president appoints me, and I've been a father for 10 years when the two presidents at the University of Miami. So when I'm appointed, president wants frank and very uh, direct uh, input on um, a variety of things, which also includes um, diversity, equity, and inclusion. So that when Renee is talking to me, uh, uh, oftentimes it is not even a matter of me taking news. It's a matter for me of me facilitating interaction uh, between athletics and um, um, and the administration. My role is to be the liaison between the athletics and the faculty, uh, that is the rest of the university. So everybody has mentioned, um, you know, the individuals that you work with, talk to specifically at, at the University of Miami, this standing mm -hmm. committee that's been revitalized. Can you guys just give uh, um, all of our guests pointed examples of individuals that they need to be partnering with within the department yeah. across the campus as they begin to look at what they may be tasked with to your point Renee rather they're prepared to create a full plan or not it may be something that they're tasked with so who are the people that they need to try and have around the table to begin this difficult work I'll let Dr. Spivey start start that okay and then I'll jump in you want to Don yeah, okay. okay. Me I mean, I, I do think the standing committee, look, I've asked the president and the provost about this committee. I said, it, what is the stature of this committee? And they respond, this is the committee. All right, that's all we need to know, that this is the committee, that we have the responsibility and we have the, the uh, mechanism to get things, get things done. And we're often, right, through me and through others, we bring this, this whatever the news might be uh, to the president and we expect uh, there to be, to be movement. What I think is crucial, that unit represents the entire university. You've gotta be, you've gotta have representation as I've been reminded of, of not only faculty, of students, but of staff. And you've gotta be concerned with all three. And beyond that, you gotta be concerned with the larger community. In fact, we have uh, within our standing committee, what I call the round table, which is a 21 members uh, of, of that group. Uh, and we call it the, the group for diversity, equity, inclusion, and civic engagement. Because we all have a larger responsibility to the larger communities out there. You know what I'm talking about, the black folks out there who are not privileged to be attending these universities. Uh, et cetera, and, and they've got to have a voice uh, and got to be a part of your game plan. So all of that is, is I think, crucial in terms of how you set this up, that you have these lines of, of communication, uh, that you talk among your, yourselves about what needs to be done, and you don't forget that your partners are everyone. It's not just the faculty. It's not just the students. And of course, without right. students, Right, there would be no universities, right? We all serve the, the students, but also the staff and that larger community out there. Uh, so let me add and before you jump in, um, as you think through this question, are there specific individuals on a campus, regardless of the campus, that you would tell 
others that are watching that they need to try and get involved in this work? Yes. Yes. And I was going to say the, the FAR is one. If, it, regardless if the FAR is into the DEI work, it does not matter. The FAR has an ear to the president. So if you are a designee, you can create a alignment with the FAR and still have some direct contact with the president in, in that way. So the FAR is one. The, the other person is, is there a uh, chief diversity officer for the university. So mm -hmm. here at Miami, we don't specifically have one. We have Don, Marvin, and Dr. Mm -hmm. Renee Callen, who mm -hmm. share this the standing committee. So they are technically working as our chief diversity officers for the University of Miami. So do you have someone that is listed there? Do you have someone in the Office of Disabilities and uh, Disability mm -hmm. Services or what? whatever the name of it is called at your institution, but someone that you can connect with in that area or someone that deals with special populations on your campus. So who's in the veteran affairs area? Who's in the LGBTQ area? Who are all of those specific people in those areas that you can, if you don't have a specific center for the women's studies and what have you, you may have a professor that oversees that or chairs that major. So you want to connect with a faculty member or professor in that space. Um, and, then, and then finally, I, I, will, I will say it is incumbent on you if you can get to the president and you have that relationship, um, that, that, that's wonderful. But those are a few people that I know sit on our committee. Oh, and I'm, I, we mentioned HR, of course, but definitely HR is, is, in that, is in that realm as well. So our standing committee, as, he, as Don has said, is 41 people, and they represent people from all of our different campuses that have space in, and sit and reside in those specific areas. So let, let me be clear, and, and, and um, Renee answered the question um, in terms of, um, understanding that um, you shouldn't work in isolation. And so all of the relevant units that affect the academic, the, uh, uh, the mental health, the well-being of uh, students, are uh, you should uh, have contact with on a campus. But here's the important thing. You shouldn't be working in isolation. And therefore, by having um, not just a person, but, but having a body, what we've created at Miami is a standing committee that is not only visible, that is sanctioned as that body by the uh, administration to lead the way. So that body has to have visibility. So what we've done is we've developed a, a, um, a website and we, among other things, that is being, a, a, we, we can be a clearinghouse that, and a resource for um, diversity DEI designees. We also provide um, ongoing information on what is happening with DEI across the campus by having a dashboard. I mean, a real time dashboard. We can see the progress in very um, units, people can look at themselves and say, how do we stand as a unit at the university relative to other units? You know, so we we not only have the charge as, as a committee, but we also um, uh, facilitate uh, communication about where we stand, not just as a university, but in the various sectors and parts of the university. Um, so it becomes important for department chairs, for individual faculty, for others to see where um, they may be able to interact and reach out to diversity and e equity and inclusion offices, designees in various parts of the university, including athletics. Could I just add one thing? I, I think the, the structure is also are very important, it, but every institution is different. At some universities, uh, the, the, the person 
is a designated uh, vice yeah. president for diversity, equity, and inclusion, et cetera. So, At this university, I play the role of a special advisor to the president on, on racial justice. And I tell you, quite frankly, I like this role. If it had been a, a strictly administered, let's, let's say they were hiring for someone to be the vice president for diversity, equity, and inclusion, it wouldn't be me. <laughs> I was, right, I was right. on my way out the door to retirement and I, I really don't want to do those kinds of tasks anymore in terms of administration. What this president has set uh, up as the goal here is that these ideas are mainstream. Uh, in other words, everybody there, I meet with the cabinet, right? The president, the provost, the entire cabinet of the, of the university, athletics, your, the, the medical campus, uh, you, you name it, uh, et cetera. And the goal being, that uh, the, the, the fi chief financial officer, et cetera, the goal being that everyone is responsible. Uh, and thus I have separate meetings virtually on a weekly basis with the president and the provost to inform them what we did last week, what we're doing this week, uh, et cetera, and pushing the 15 point plan forward. So structures can be different. Uh, there's no question yeah. about yeah. it. So please keep that in mind. Well, and, and to that point, Dr. Spivey, I would have to guess from feedback that we've gotten from um, ADID designees is that structures are extremely different. And many of them mm -hmm. don't have this top-down mentality around this work. And yeah. so, you know, with that being said, how do people create, because a big part of this designation is around education. Right. So how do individuals create education program in collaboration with folks in their athletic department or across the campus? How, how can people get some pointers of things they can begin to do until their college or university gets to a space where they have this top down buy in of the work of DE and I? Yeah. Let me let me say just a few words on that. Um, education is extremely important because um, without an understanding what DEI involves and what it doesn't involve, what it doesn't mean, there is um, there are misconceptions that can actually make it very difficult. Um, to make progress. One of the uh, things that, um, that I think is important is to have the very uh, basics, the basic knowledge of the, uh, the education fed to the whole community in doses uh, by having a, a column or, or a section on your um, university's news or uh, communications um, 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 mechanism that is used, whether it's a kind of a daily newspaper type, you know, listing of news, just to have a section on um, DI and and just have that fed to people, just generally, you know, that's a beginning. That's not sufficient, but I think that's a good starting point to have a regular column that you could just define basic things, you know, so that people can understand what when terms are used, what they mean. Like I was talking about equity, people um, I find, and it's quite surprising to me because I find it even among uh, um, faculty in, so, in, in the social sciences to say, what is, what's the difference between equity and equality? They think, they think that diversity, I've heard people say diversity, equality, and inclusion. And it's, just, I don't know, it's a, 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 equity is just about fairness, you know? But to have, a, to answer your question, to have as a starting point, a regular um, mode of communication that's 
on your campus that you are able to communicate directly with people just on definitional things, just on basic things. Renee, do you have anything to add to that? No, I, I think he, he hit it, hit it on head. Awesome, Dr. Spivey, anything? Perfect. We will move on to the next because I know that this is also one that has continued to come up um, within the athletic department. I'll use myself. If I was designated as the ADID, how do I get my peers in the athletic department who are coaches and who are concerned about recruiting athletes and teams and keeping eligible? How do I get my coaching peers? How do I get my administrative peers within my department into this work and feeling like it is the work of all of us and not just myself as the ADID? Yes, Renee, how do you do that, Renee? Renee is really on the spot. How do you do that, Renee? <laughs> so, uh, well, one of the one of the ways we I do that is uh, actually I pitch. I have pitched since being honest since the George uh, murder of George Floyd. I have pitched DEI in our department as a recruiting tool, not just for staff, but for student athletes. I've actually pitched that idea as a recruiting tool for our conference. So when my conference commissioner even knows, um, I said, let the ACC be the place where student athletes of color know they can come and they can play and not be judged and be whoever they want to be in their whole full selves. And let that be part of who we are as a conference and all 15 institutions see it in that manner. Now you're now you are telling the people who may go to an SEC school, no, go play at the ACC because they're gonna let you be. If you're transgender, they're gonna let you be your full self in the, at a school in the ACC. If you are LGBT, they're gonna let you be your full self. If you are, I'm black and I'm proud, you can be your full self in the ACC at a ACC institution. So I have pitched it to our coaches and staff as a recruiting tool, specifically if you're looking for students of color um, or, or students um, in LGBT community, they know that they can come to the, to, to the U and they can be good. They can be good students and they can be good athletes and they will feel loved and they will feel welcome. So that's how I get them involved. I don't, I don't preach it from a standpoint of you have to do this. This is so important. Why don't you feel um, this is some work that you should be involved in. I don't preach it in that way. I teach it from the standpoint of how can this benefit them? They have to see it in a way that benefits them. And recruiting is their lifeline. That's their lifeblood. And that's what I use. So in other words, Renee, what you're saying, and I want to just elaborate uh, a bit, uh, <clears throat> the wrong thing to do is to pick up a bat and hold the bat and beat people over the head about DEI. So I think the worst thing that you could do is to say, I got the bat, or even to say it's mandated. What you've got to do is you've got to have people to understand how it's in their best interest to talk about the strengths of DEI and the benefits of DEI to achieving the goals that they are committed to. And um, we can have a long uh, talk, we won't, about why diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives are important for any organization in terms of improving the productivity, approving the, improving the climate, improving the interpersonal relations that occur in an organization. So there are advantages of having an organization 
that is diverse, that operates on principles of equity and inclusion. And the buy-in then comes from them. The job then doesn't require the big stick. Yeah. Well, uh, last year, Angel, we had a uh, nine-week session with all our coaches, and we had 87% of our staff participate in it. So it was nine weeks of education and training. And so literally, we went from how did Black people get to the country to what's redlining? We mm-hmm. went through, it was six, yeah. maybe it was, I said nine weeks, I think it was more like six weeks, but we went through the session of conversations ten at 10 or 12 people in groups, different groups, having those, having those conversations. 87% of our staff participated. Today, just today, at from 2 to 5 p.m., I have the uh, Annette Laredo from the Office of Equity coming over, and she's going to do 30-minute sessions, 30-minute quick sessions on implicit bias. Staff have taken an implicit bias test before they come. I didn't tell them which one they want they, they could take, to whichever one you think you know you want to take. That's fine. But they'll come in, but they'll just learn about what that what bias is and in general. But I just set up the sessions and they sign up for it. Right now we have about 25 people signed up to, to come to those 30-minute quick sessions come in, hear about Im- implicit bias, learn about it, and then move on. We're in athletics. We don't do a lot of long-winded presentations because we like things in sound bites. So as the ADID person, I will encourage you to work to, to do things just like the coaches do. Do it in sound bites. Make it short and sweet. Don't have long presentations that they have to they, they have to go to. Or make sure that that presentation is interesting enough to keep their um, keep their attention, but you have to have something that's ongoing. Come having a speaker here and there is not going to get it done. So, so somebody me, has to keep that going. Somebody has to so, keep that moving in the department. Let, let me interrupt you. Let me interrupt you. So, oh, somebody says to you, uh, "There she goes again. Here she comes again with all of this mess." Well, I mean, why do we have to keep? giving her our important time so she could tell us this all of this whole stuff. We know this. If you, you knew it, we wouldn't be we wouldn't be in the position that we're in. <laughs> so that's why. Well you know well you know Re- Renee and I go through this kind of thing all the time. I answer the challenging questions. You know um diversity, equity and inclusion goals and initiatives and goals uh should not be uh, imposed um they should be things that uh, become part of the values of the organization and, and hopefully of the individual. Sometimes you have to keep saying things over and over and over and over again. For some people it's gonna click, for others it's not. I think it is important not just to, not just to continue to, to, to talk about the need for it, but to make it very clear that I'm just another person at the table. You know, I'm just, I'm, I'm, it's just a different perspective uh, that adds to the range of perspectives that are here. And uh, people will respect you if you don't try to force it down their throats or force things. I think when they hear it enough and they begin to see uh, what difference it makes if they even adopt some things, you want to get buy-in, you want to achieve buy-in. They become stakeholders for the organization, knowing and seeing how these things that are initiated have improved things. So you have to sometimes see it in doses and see the change occurring slowly. So if you are, Renee sounds like she is, she sounds like she's ready to impose it on everybody, (laughs) but she isn't. Uh, So the point is that uh, if you come into this role and expect instant changes, or for everybody to sit down and, and feel like you're paying attention to the preacher uh, uh, and not falling asleep in church, uh, don't get upset if some people fall asleep, you know? Um, if they hear enough in, in, in little doses, uh, you've got to watch to see if there are changes. You got to compliment, you got to let people know, you got to reinforce. So this, this is a role, this is a, 
this is a, a this is you're pioneers. You guys are pioneers. And so don't expect that things are going to happen immediately and right off, but you've got to put the seeds there and you've got to water them and you've got to keep it moving like Renee is describing. But don't expect in instant uh, um, changes. Well, could, could, could From I August to April. Add? Oh, go ahead, Doc. Go ahead, Don. I, I just wanted to add to that, uh, that uh, it's absolutely correct. What Renee and Marvin have, have been telling you is, but you've got to learn to, to you've, you've got to be ready to deal with frustration, but you don't give up. You just keep doing it. It's like speaking to an audience and you look out there and you see that there are two people. Well, you give the same talk, right? And, and you move on. You're going to have some faculty. Look, I meet with all, all the deans. I'm meeting with all the chairs of every academic department, uh, et cetera. And you and I, you know, we're among friends. You know as well as I do, there are some people who absolutely oppose any kind of change, any kind of diversity, equity. Hopefully Ooh, they're in boy. a tiny <laughs> minority, but you don't get frustrated. You've got to keep going. You keep doing this, uh, et cetera. Uh, and the change will come. Angel, I was just going to add that our staff is required. So the ACC passed uh, legislation within our uh, within our conference that all our institutions must participate in some level of diversity, equity, and inclusion training during the year. We at the University of Miami decided how we would do that is require our staff to do at least five hours of diversity, equity, and inclusion from between August and April of every year. We have to attest, and the president has to attest, the athletic director and the president have to attest to this in our conference. Just like we do with sexual assault yes. training, we must yes. attest also to DEI training within the ACC. And so five hours of training is what we have committed to doing here at, 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 Uni at the University of Miami. And it has gone, it has gone well. People do what they need to do, even if they see it as something that they just have to check off. As Marvin said, the preacher keeps preaching if you go to church. If you don't get saved and you decide to go to hell, that's on you. But mm -hmm. the preacher has to keep preaching. And so me, I'm the preacher. I'm going to keep preaching it and telling the story the way I need to tell it. And hopefully it picks up and, and you and you, you know, and you and you get some yeah. knowledge about it. You know, if you are an anti-training person like I am or thought I was, um, you know, I said, I don't need no training, you know? Um, you will be just amazed at how creative training modules are these days, how engaged, how engaging they can be and how, how training today is not like training in my um, idea of what training is, a lot of people on the faculty um, are like me. Uh, and I found that if you look at the creative module, mod, modules and the programs that are out there now, you can find some things, sometimes you have to pay for it. You can find um, simulations, all kinds of ways that training is done now. So DEI training, and I've seen a number of different modules. I mean, it can be, it can be really, really engaging and really, really successful. So, so when when you say that, um, uh, Renee, that we're committed to these training uh, modules, they're really good. Uh, that's really good now because we actually started out with some things at our institution that were really terrible, but now we have excellent um, training. I mean, I'll say that because they were, you know. We have a, a couple of questions starting to come in. So specifically, Renee, um, you talked about the ACC and the attestation of the DE&I work that y'all have agreed to. Can you speak a little bit about how you require within your athletic department um, that five hours of programming? Um, has there been anything added to the annual evaluations? Um, and when you do programmings, trainings, things of the sort electronically, how are you tracking those? Yeah, so so number so number one, I um, have buy-in, um, I think maybe it's from sure it's national news, but you know, my former athletic director, Blake James, 
was totally on board. So there wasn't a question as to who wasn't going to get training done. It was going to be done. And so we didn't, we don't mandate it. We provide enough opportunities. And so I would say that too, but between August and April, no matter what your season is, football coaches may complain they can't get it done in the fall. Basketball coaches may complain they can't get it done in the spring. So we provide enough opportunities between August and April for people to get five hours of, of credit for DEI in the athletic department, including things that are happening on campus. So there are enough opportunities in the athletic department. There are enough opportunities on the broader campus and then there are things within the community that people can send to me and say, hey, I went to this session with this count as DEI credit. And I say, yes, absolutely. And I asked them for just a brief write-up of what it was about and when did they go. And so the, the recording mechanism is really you know, simple and archaic. I just write their name down. I have a list of all of our employees and of 210 people that work in our athletic department. And I have just a list and I just record what that person attended. And so all of the sessions that we have in the department or on campus, we had an unconscious bias um, uh, session that I, that I sent to them. That was through, someone asked about what kind of modules through LinkedIn Learning. I'm not certain if LinkedIn Learning is available just for free. I'm not certain, but through the University of Miami, we've, we've um, subscribed to LinkedIn learning modules that any of our staff can go, go in. They can just type in the word diversity on our Learn website and go in and watch all five hours of, the, uh, of diversity and equity and inclusion today if they wanted to and send me their completion, their certificate of completion of that module. And then I record that they have done that. So those are some ways that we uh, keep record of it. it. Again, it is tedious, but because I am the ADID person and it is a requirement for, for our department that I'm the person tasked with keeping up with that. And just as a quick follow-up to that um, with the LinkedIn learning module, are there any other modules that you've used um, in the last you know, year or two that you find to really bring the department along? I'm going to pitch it because I've just started it, but I wanted to do this early on. Uh, return on inclusion. Um, I'm, I'm, it, again, it will maybe cost your institution and your department to do it. Um, but I, I believe in what those modules will do for your staff. And again, you can do it at any time. And they're specific for athletics, which is what, what's the good thing, because the people who help create it work in athletics or formerly worked in athletics. So they have put it in a way where the language is not so extensive that folks in athletics won't get it. They won't you know, mess up what's equity or what's you know, said, you know, inclusion, they will know what it means. And so uh, return on inclusion, ROI is the um, module that I will, and I don't, again, I don't have the website with, with me right now, but I'm sure um, my, my friend will not um, be bashful uh, about sending that if someone else has it on here and is doing it. Yes, we have that in the chat for people. So the direct link is there for the- Great, return. thank you guys. No, thank you, Renee. Um, so another question, as we talk about these different programmings and educations, a lot of times they're completely focused on the staff. What type of things can the ADID in collaboration with the staff do for education for students? And as a secondary to that, do you believe that this DEI work and training should be focused in athletics or more collaborative around campus? I'm gonna to touch that last one first because Don and Marvin are, are here and it has to be collaborative. There is no way because athletics doesn't operate in a silo. 
you 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 are a part of campus. So you need to have those collabor collaborative uh, discussions with people on the broader campus and tap into things that they already have going on. I'm not going to create any new programs that multicultural student affairs already has listed on their calendar. So I go to their calendar and see what is being offered. And I say, hmm, these might be good for our student athletes. They may be interested in, in looking at that. And I send it to our senior associate AD for development, Sherelle Jackson, who then determines, okay, what, what are our student athletes doing as, as a group when it comes to DEI? The SAC group has, de, has a designated someone in their uh, 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 executive team to be the designated person for diversity, equity, and inclusion. So they are tasked with working with me, working with Sherelle, finding opportunities to um, get students involved in, in, in uh, sessions as well. We have a Black Student Athlete Alliance group um, that was recently created in the midst of the George Floyd um, incident. And they have taken the ball and run. Um, they, they, they moved the needle. I, I talk about Michelle Atherley, who's a former, athlete, a former athlete here and an Olympian as well, um, will be an Olympian. I say she, I'm, I'm, I'm speaking it into existence for her. Um, but they've taken the ball and run and, and have just said, and I, I, again, our athletic director has said, do what you guys feel is necessary. We don't want to silence the voices of our student athletes in this way. So anything that is available for staff in the evenings, I'll say most of the times in the evenings when we do things for the students is also available for staff and students. So if a student wants to drop in on one of the implicit bias uh, test you know, discussions today, well, they know that it's available because the student athlete development staff has told them, hey, you might want to drop in and, and have this discussion. Now they even get to intermingle with our staff and know our staff even better. So we provide those opportunities to students as well. And, and you know, and it's good too to have activist students. Uh, I can tell you that uh, our student body here, there are activist elements in it, particularly now with Landon Coles, who's the uh, president of the uh, uh, student government here at the university. He's the former president of Black United Students. He is a person of color, right? Who's now the, the uh, head of a uh, president of, of student government. And I just attended one of their events uh, last week and it was involving outreach to the larger communities, uh, et cetera. The, the students are, are on board with, with this, this kind of movement. Uh, they have been protesting uh, here. That's one of the reasons the university has now made a commitment to develop an African-American cultural center. In fact, there's going to be a cultural center complex, not just a, in separate individual spaces for, uh, for Black students, for LBTQ students, uh, for, for handicapped students, for Hispanic students, etc. And it's a cultural uh, complex, and they're redoing space uh, for this. I had the privilege of serving on the, the committee that was naming these spaces uh, and all of the, the new spaces will be named after black alumni. So that that's progress too. And largely it's come about by the activism of our students. The new student advisory center uh, will be named after a black alum uh, as, as well. In fact, we've, we've uh, confidentially submitted the, the names. It was a <clears throat> committee chaired by former uh, board of trustee uh, head, uh, Hillary Bass, uh, et cetera. And this past summer, we made those, those, those recommendations. So there, there are things going on. I, I've got to tell you though, <laughs> I see progress being made by students, progress being made by staff. But one of the most difficult areas of the doggone faculty <laughs> quite, quite frankly, to get them uh, to attend uh, racial bias training, and, and indeed uh, they need it. Uh, I've attended what I, I found is a very helpful program, uh, interactive theater, uh, which which uh, uh, is is a, 
the, the module there uh, involves, uh, they have professional actors, so you don't have to do any acting, uh, et cetera, but you participate in evaluating these scenes, et cetera. And they, they deal with issues of recruitment, bias on campus, uh, so forth and, uh, and so on. And they're very helpful. And the faculty need this. The president and the provost are trying to find ways to mandate this with the faculty. You can't mandate anything with the faculty. <laughs> if you want the faculty to go left, tell them to go right. If you want the faculty to sit down, tell them to stand up, <laughs> right? So, so that, that is a challenge. Do you give up? Absolutely not. You, you keep going. Uh, these are the, this is what I'm talking about in terms of dealing with, with frustration, what seems to be challenges. You just keep on going. We know that the number of faculty now who are voluntarily participating uh, in these, these anti these race bias training sessions has increased. Uh, and so you keep on going uh, in the right direction. And that, that's what's happening. You can't be frustrated. You have to keep on trying. Absolutely, Dr. Spivey. Thank you for those comments. Um, I have time, it looks like, for one more question. Um, and can you talk to what may have been one of the most difficult parts of implementing any type of programming or education and how you overcame that? Rather it be as part of this longstanding committee and what challenges may have, you know, arose there or um, you know, Renee, if it's been in the athletic department and creating some programs and what challenges you've had there and how you've overcome them. Yeah, I would love for Don to talk about the conversation that he had with President Frank when he <laughs> was um, going to take this role and position, the challenge that started, you know, with why you came into being, Don. Well, well I, I, I'll tell you, Renee, that the truth of the matter is that this president, is committed to doing these things. I've been here 28 years. I've dealt with every president that, that has been in place, Tad Foote, President Donna Shalala, uh, et cetera. And their provosts, uh, Louis Glazer, uh, uh, Tom LeBlanc, uh, et cetera. And this president and this provost a mean business. Uh, and that's a key element. I would urge you on your campuses, as you're listening, work on your president and your provost because they in fact run the shop. I'm an advisor. I meet with all the deans. I, I'm meeting with all the chairs of all the academic departments. They know I'm an advisor, meaning I don't have any real power. I don't, you know, I can go back and I can report to the president and the provost, but the president and the provost, and I'm telling you, they've been telling them, you will do these things. Look, if we go from, bringing in only two black faculty members a year to now bringing in 14. That's not because they, that Don Spivey told them things. No, that's because they know that the president and the provost, and I've complimented the provost because he, he won't take credit, but we know the provost runs the place. And if the provost tells the deans, you will do this, they're gonna do it, right? And that, that's, that's the, uh, the reality. So wherever you're at, you need the higher administration to buy into this. If you can get them on your side to help push these things and be committed to these things, because this is a, these are rank order institutions. You're gonna have enough problems dealing with, with, with deans and, and with, with department chairs and good God, uh, and, and all, all the rest. But, but if you can get the very top of the institution to understand how this is important and they mandate it, things will change. Yeah, Angel, I, I will say, and I, don't, I think I did not, um, I think Reagan asked that question too about the performance evaluation piece. This is a tie-in to where if, it, if you feel like it is a challenge, how you can possibly make it not be a challenge if it is a part of your performance evaluation. So simply, it is not formal. I'll say that. Diversity, equity, and inclusion is not a formal part of our performance evaluation in our department. 
but there you feel the weight of the pressure to make certain that you are on board. So for certain, I know that there are some people in our department who do not want to participate in any of the sessions that we offer. However, they make certain that they check that box because it is a value for the athletic director and the department. It's diversity is in our direct values, is the D in our direct values for the University of Miami. We have D-I-R-C-C-T, direct. The first word is diversity. So there's no way that you can get around it. Is diversity even in your strategic plan? Is it somewhere, if you're the ADID person and you get a hold of your department's strategic plan and you see the word diversity anywhere mixed into that, guess what? It must be a value. So what? I'm going to go and talk to my athletic director and say, hey, you know, 15 years ago, you guys said that diversity was, you know, a part of, and the university has also made that a part of it. And so we are going to be in alignment with the university, correct? So let's, you know, work, work on that and making it a part of our performance evaluation, making people feel like it is needed and necessary. So I have not had the challenges that some I know have had because I've had, you know, uh, the leadership has been supportive, but when you do not have supportive leadership, you do you should ask yourself that question: Am I in the right space? Am I at the right <laughs> at the right place? If this means something to you, then then you should ha ask yourself that question: Is it the right place for me? For, for your comments, and you know, as this is a difficult conversation to really get the most out of, but I want to make sure that we drop, you know, the dimes that you guys have dropped throughout this. I want to make sure that we leave some keys for people as far as, and to your point, Renee, keys to success in this. So if you were jumping in, jumping out, just want to make sure that, you know, we reiterate a few things. So some of the keys to being successful in this space is going to be collaboration within your department and across the campus, consulting with other institutions that are doing this same work. Division doesn't make a difference in this work. This is how we actually get to creating an experience for our students and the individuals that support them. As it was stated here, without those students, we don't have our colleges and universities. Um, having faculty, especially your FAR, being engaged in this work as they have a direct line to decision makers. So rather that be your chancellor, your provost, your president, making sure that you have the FAR involved in this work. Depending on your campus, identifying the individuals that are doing diverse work, rather it be of individuals, rather it be of different groups, whatever the case may be, making sure you're identifying those folks on your campus. If you are in a space where you have the opportunity to have a voice at the table, getting a standing committee, if it falls in line with institutional goals or the institution strategic plan. So this is a good place for you to do your homework as the ADID of what your institution says they stand on. So if any part of that strategic plan is speaking to those items, you may sure that you bring that up within your department with your athletic director and then your advocates across campus that have direct lines to decision makers. When it comes to education, you want to make sure that you are providing education to all, but you need to make sure that things are quick hitters, sound bites. You know, you are getting to the promised land for folks and not overbearing them or hitting them over the head with this difficult work. You want to create buy-in. This is institutional work, not individual work. So just make sure that you are being engaged with others. And you wanna provide enough opportunities, so this is multiple things, so that regardless of how your athletic career goes, that people have opportunities to access the information that you're providing. I know that we are short on time, um, I want to thank each of our panelists for being with us and representing the University of Miami so well. We can all strive to have that type of system that is clearly 
inclusive in the work. And, and I say often to Dr. Um, Dawkins' actual comments, diversity is a checkbox. Inclusion requires action. So I just recommend to you all that you take whatever steps and use any powers that you do have to have your institutions act. Um, at this time, I want to pass it over to uh, Marquetta uh, for closing remarks from MOIC and the commitment to ADID. Everybody, I want to thank you all for, for being here and participating today. Thank you for the panelists. You all were awesome. It was great, great information. Um, and so I just want to real quick go over the MOIC's mission and really you know, what we're doing to support our ADIDs. Um, and so just for those who don't know, the MOIC shall review issues related to the interests and advocacy of student athletes, coaches and administrators who are ethnic minority, uh, LGBTQIA plus or have disabilities and review and advocate for NCA programs and policies that affect and include but are not limited to ethnic minorities, individuals with disabilities, and the LGBTQ community. Um, so as you can see, just by our mission statement alone, we are very committed to the DE and I work. Um, and so some of the things that we are doing right now, we have created a ADID subcommittee within MOIC. And actually, University of Miami, you all would be happy about this, Shante O'Neill is a part of that subcommittee and she's one of your very own uh, at the University of Miami. Um, so we're super excited to have her. And what our subcommittee is doing is right now we are working with the Office of Inclusion to, uh, we're working on creating a, a resource that'll be called optimizing the ADID role. And so there'll be three different, three different versions of this. And so one version will be for those who are in house in athletics, those will be for um, another would be for those who are housed in a conference, our conference ADIDs, and also our ADIDs who are not who are housed outside of the athletic department. Um, and so I'm super excited to be the chair of this and to carry on the legacy of um, those who, who have held this position before me. Um, and I'm super excited to, to work with everybody. Um, so be sure to make sure that you reach out if you have any other questions, concerns. Or you know, you just want to say you know what your experience is. The more we know, the more we can really tailor um, tailor our resources to make sure that you all feel comfortable in the roles that you all you all are in, um, because they are very very important roles, um, not just for the NCAA, but just kind of doing my research. Most institutions now are really diving into the our work. So your role on campus is extremely important, um, and I think the advice that we heard from our panelists today. Was, was very important and some, some things that I'll definitely keep in mind for myself because I'm definitely more assertive. I am the one with the bat. <laughs> so I'll make sure that I'm not beating people over the head uh, with that bat because this is something that is um, very, very important um, to myself. Um, and I know that it's important to our institution as well. So thank you all again for, for being here. Um, and I just wanted to take a quick second to say hello and to let you know that we're here and we're supporting you all. Um, and I'm, I'm gonna take this opportunity to pass it back over to Abigail Edwards, who's going to give us some closing remarks. Thank you all. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Abigail Edwards. My pronouns are she, her, hers, and I serve as the postgraduate intern in the Office of Inclusion. What an amazing session. I've seen the chat filled with positive comments. Um, today's session was filled with meaningful dialogue and powerful insights about how best to serve your campus communities, diversity, equity, and inclusion related needs. As Dr. Angel Mainson wrapped up really well, collaboration, alignment, and strategy are all integral to diversity, equity, and inclusion work. As my colleague Naya reminded us during our session last week, this work is a shared responsibility, and we must keep moving forward to make a difference. One program, one initiative, one conversation at a time. So thank you again to Dr. Angel Mason, our distinguished panelists, Dr. Marvin Dawkins, Dr. Renee Miles Payne, and Dr. and Dr. Donald Spivy, Stan and Marquetta, and all of you for being with us today. Please note that a recording of today's program will be available on the Office of Inclusion's webpage in early December. On behalf of the Office of Inclusion, thank you again to MOA and to all of our ADIDs who are championing diversity, equity, and inclusion work within your communities. We look forward to, champ to continuing to provide you with support and resources. Have a wonderful rest of your day. <laughs>